Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm Britain's most haunted historian. Ghost stories have been told at Christmas for hundreds and hundreds of years. The coming of dark nights, howling winds, snow and frost has always been the traditional time for sitting round the Christmas fire and telling ghost stories. With the coming of, of television and radio, it to a certain extent has stopped people actually carrying out the traditional ways of telling ghost stories. And for many, many years, I'm sure a lot of you remember either sitting around the TV on Christmas Eve or sitting around the radio and listening to traditional ghost stories. For some strange reason, we don't get them anymore. It's something that every year, as Christmas came, I always looked in the Radio Times, the TV Times, to see whether there was a ghost story on for Christmas. So, strange isn't it that with TV, video and DVD, that now we can actually bring you those ghost stories that you've always wanted to hear at Christmas. So what I want you to do now is settle back into the armchair, just as I'm going to do. Throw another log on the fire, or of course, turn the gas fire up, the electric fire up, or even the central heating. Turn down the lights and let me tell you some traditional ghost stories for Christmas. People sitting at dinner telling stories or listening to speakers or sitting round the Yule Log at Christmas always ask that question to people. Have you ever seen a ghost? Most people say no. I can say yes. I have actually seen two ghosts but I've also heard a ghost and I'd like to tell you of my very first experience ever of seeing a ghost. I've always been frightened of ghosts. As a young child, from probably the age of four, I was terrified, frightened of the green ghost. I expected it to be standing at the foot of my bed in the middle of the night with red staring eyes, black matted hair, horns, clanking chains, there to terrify me. Luckily, it never happened to me. In fact, it wasn't until I was about 27 that I actually had an encounter. But it wasn't seeing a ghost. It was hearing a ghost. It was 1977. I was an officer cadet in the Territorial Army and we were away on an exercise. It was the middle of winter. And we'd been out for about three days fighting. Pretend fighting, of course. It was the Territorial Army. It was manoeuvres. And we ended up at a place called Bestwood Lodge in Nottingham. Very old place, very spooky looking place. Built by King Charles II for Nell Gwynne. So it had a good history about it. But remember, I was a soldier. I was on exercise. I was the radio operator at the time. And the last thing that I was thinking about was ghosts. We were attacked by a battalion of the Queen's Regiment about one o'clock in the morning. There were thunder flashes going. There were blanks being fired from rifles. And Everything was very busy. I was, to say the least, very, very excited. I always wanted to be a soldier, and so for me to be there in a mock battle, to me was one of the greatest experiences that I could ever wish to have. Anyway, we won. We beat the Queen's Regiment, and they retreated. And we went back to the place where we were billeted, which, strangely enough, wasn't an old part of the building at all, but was a, 
a 1930s style, very large classroom at the end of one of the buildings in Bestwood Lodge. Everyone had gone back before me, because I went back with the officer, I was, I was the radio operator, so I'd stayed out. And as I told you, we'd been out for two or three days. Everyone was tired, and they'd got their heads back straight away onto their sleeping bags, and they were all fast asleep, snoring. I came back in, got back into my sleeping bag, and lay down, ready for my well-earned rest, for my sleep. At the very end of the room, the moon was shining through a very large picture window, and silhouetted against it was a sergeant. He was obviously, he was still awake, but he was quite a long way from where I was. I lay down, eyes closed, and then all of a sudden I heard a noise, a noise at the back of me, um, where one of the doors was, through to a kitchen. And I went to get my rifle. We're being attacked again, someone's coming in. Nothing happened. And then, at the back of me, almost in the wall, a voice started up. The voice of a young man, a young man of about 17 or 18, moaning, groaning, crying, calling for a nurse and saying over and over again, nurse, 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 it hurts, nurse. Well, I turned around and looked. There was no one there, apart from a soldier on the right of me and a soldier on the left of me in their sleeping bags, snoring. And of course, I thought, oh, yes. Yes, of course. The snoring sounds like the voice of someone calling for a nurse. Well, I have to admit, it does a little bit. Nurse, nurse, sounds a bit like. <coughs> yeah, at first, until you really sit up in your bed and listen, and you know for a fact that it really is the voice of a young man. A man in distress, a man in pain, a man who really is calling for a nurse, a man who, in my opinion, was dying. I ended up listening for quite a while with tears trickling down my cheeks, tears of emotion as I was listening to this young boy. But I couldn't help him. I couldn't press the buzzer to fetch a nurse to him because I wasn't in a hospital. There wasn't a nurse, there was only me. And eventually, I fell asleep, as you do. And everyone will say, yeah, of course, you were overtired. You had a dream. But next morning, when I woke, I was so excited at what I'd heard. I didn't tell anyone, of course. You wouldn't. You certainly wouldn't tell 37 squaddies that you'd heard a ghost last night. So I kept it to myself. I told no one. The only thing that bothered me was that I thought it might come with me, that for some reason it may have latched itself onto me and followed me to the rest of where we were going during our fortnight's camp. Now, strangely enough, we were driving down to Sennybridge to finish off our annual camp. With me was a chap, a soldier called Charlie Zamet, a Maltese chap, and a girl from the Women's Royal Army Corps. I was driving the minibus. We were talking about where we'd been on the exercise. And I said, oh, well, the last night we, we spent at Bestwood Lodge in Nottingham. Oh, yes, she said. That place is haunted. I said, yes. Yes, I know that. She says, no, I'll tell you, there's an article in the Nottingham Evening Post all about it. And, and I said, stop. Don't, don't say any more to me until I tell you something. And I said, Charlie, you're witness to this. Am I right in saying that during the war, that building was a hospital? <gasps> yes, she said, exactly. She said, in fact, that's what the article's about. And I said, yes, yes, I know all about it. 
I've actually heard one of the chaps that died there during the war. Now, I've never, ever to this day seen that article. I never bothered to get it. I could now go and say, right, here in my pocket is the very newspaper with that article in it to prove it to you. I didn't. I don't know why. It bothered me afterwards, because as I've already said, I thought it might just follow me round. I thought when I was on guard duty at three o'clock in the morning in an ammunition pound at Sennybridge Camp alone, that perhaps the spirit of that young lad might be there, might be with me. I was looking all the time to see if I could see him, but he wasn't there. He's grounded. He doesn't go with anyone. He stays, for whatever reason, in that room in Bestwood Lodge. And he haunts that place. And he still, every now and then, asks for help. Asks for help from the nurses that are no longer there. So that, that is a story of mine. I have others because I've seen two ghosts as well. But I'll, I'll tell you about those as we go along. But I'll tell you now of a very interesting story, a Christmas story to do with murder and hauntings in the centre of Derby. It was the last Monday before December 1774. There was a very large house in Tennant Street Possibly the Mayor's Parlour. In this house lived an old spinster called Mary Vickers. She was a very wealthy lady. During the night, some workmen who had just finished a late shift, and remember this was 1774, things don't change at all, were passing down Tennant Street when they heard terrified screams coming from the house in Tennant Street. They rushed in through the open front door and saw on the stairs a young maid screaming in terror. They ran upstairs to see what was wrong and she led them to a bedroom on the second floor. Into the bedroom they went and there lying in a pool of blood on the floor was the dead body of Mary Vickers. She'd been battered to death around the head. They went towards her to see if she was still alive, but there was no breathing. She was dead. And strangely enough, there were marks round her throat and marks on her fingers. What had happened during the night? Two men, George Foster and Matthew Cochran, an Irishman who worked at the Copper Works, on the homes in Derby, had broken into the house, gone up to Mary Vickers' bedroom. She got out of bed to see what was happening. Matthew Cochran had got a large iron bar with him. He beat her repeatedly around the head with the iron bar until she fell to the floor. They then started to rob her. They pulled the necklace from round her neck and they pulled all the rings off her fingers, which of course gave the marks on her fingers and her throat. While they were robbing her and breaking into her iron chest that she got in her bedroom, the maid came downstairs to see what the commotion was. She opened Mary Vickers' door to see the two men kneeling over her. Matthew Cochran shouted at her to go back up to her room, otherwise he would kill her as well. She obeyed, she turned and fled and went back to her room. Cochlan and Foster managed to open the iron trunk and in it was over 300 pounds worth of gold coins. They fled the building, went to Nuns Green, which is now Friargate, and split the money and the jewellery. One went to Leek and one went to Ashbourne. From there, they got on a boat at Liverpool for Dublin. They spent about a year in Dublin and tried their hand at highway robbery but not very successfully. They held up a stagecoach, but the guard managed to shoot Foster and kill him. Cochrane was arrested. 
and taken to Kilmainham Jail. While he was there in custody, someone saw an old wanted poster from Derby. Scotland was sent back to England and arrived in Derby in November 1776. A murder trial was put on at the Shire Hall in St Mary's Gate. There was a witness, the maid. Although it had been very dark and she couldn't recognise either of them, she remembered Cochrane's voice. And he was sentenced to hang by the judge. Now, in those days, there were so many hanging offences. You could be hanged for stealing a sheep. You could be hanged for digging up turnips. And you could also be hanged for murder. So to make the sentence worse, or the punishment worse, you were either publicly dissected or gibbeted. And the judge ordered that Matthew Cochran would be sent back from the courtroom to the place from whence he came, and there to a place of lawful execution, where you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead, and then hung up in a metal cage between heaven and earth, for the wind to bleach your bones, and the crows to peck at your flesh and peck out your eyes. Now, in those days, more than today, people were terrified of not being buried whole. They also craved a decent burial in consecrated ground. If they didn't get these things, they believed that if their body wasn't whole, that on the day of judgment, they would be condemned to eternal damnation and hell fire. The poor unfortunates that were sentenced to these awful, awful punishments were more terrified of that than of the actual death. And of course, I believe to a certain extent that's why there are so many tormented souls that still linger at the place of execution and in some of the jails of this country. Cochrane was hanged at the county gallows at the top of Normanton Road in 1776. His body was then tarred to preserve it, and he was hung up in a metal gibbet cage 30 feet high on Bradshaw Way, near to where the present Derbyshire Royal Infirmary stands. Not long after the body was hung up, some lads drinking in a tavern in St Peter's churchyard had a wager, a bet. They bet that one of them wouldn't dare go up to the gibbet post with a ladder, climb the 30 feet up to the body with a bowl of soup or gruel and offer it to Matthew Cochrane's body. Well, one young lad decided he'd do it. And all of them went, trudging in the snow, up to Bradshaw Way at 12 o'clock. It had to be 12 o'clock at night. The chimes of St. Peter's, St. Michael's, and All Saints were ringing out when the 18-year-old youth climbed up the ladder with a bowl of piping hot broth. He held it up to the lips, or what was left of the lips, of Matthew Cochrane, and said to him, Here you are, Matthew. I've got a bowl of boiling hot broth for you. And all of a sudden, a voice that seemed to emanate from the actual lips of Matthew Cochran, said to him, then thou'd better blow on it, hadn't thou? The young lad fell off the ladder, the soup went, and he ended up in a heap in the snow. 
the lads ran off. And then from behind the bottom of the gibbet post came a little chap, a ventriloquist, a local ventriloquist called Squeaking Jemmy. Someone had set them up. It wasn't a real ghost, of course, but apparently on dark, windy, wintry nights around the area of Bradshaw Way, where Derbyshire Royal Infirmary is now, people still see the ghostly figure of Matthew Cochrane wandering about. They still see the tormented soul of that man that can find no rest. A, because of the heinous crime that he committed, and B, because his bones were never buried in consecrated ground. This is a very interesting story, Christmas story, of course, to do with Derby's much-loved Elveston Castle. And for many hundreds of years, the Stanhope family, Earls of Harrington, dwelt there. They were all very keen huntsmen, but none more than Dudley Stanhope, the ninth Earl, nicknamed Old Whiskers. He was hunting near Holbrook not long before Christmas. He had a very serious riding accident and died. He was brought back to the castle at Elveston. A large funeral was held and he was duly buried in the family vault. His will was read out and part of his will stated that his beloved hounds should meet on Boxing Day, just as they would have done had he have been alive. And of course, on Boxing Day, they met. The hounds ran all the way to the Golden Gates. They then, for some reason, turned back and ran all the way back to the graveyard. And no matter how hard anyone tried, they couldn't get them to move away from a large tree that was in sight of the Earl's grave. They lingered there for ages until eventually they were brought away and taken back to the kennels. Now, many people say and it was only a small group of huntsmen that were there on that day, on that boxing day. They say that they could see the ghost of the Earl of Harrington, old whiskers, standing by that tree in the graveyard. And now to this day, the tree of course is still there. And there is in fact a plaque that's been put on the tree. And it says on it, the Happy Huntsman's Tree. And just to prove that all of this is true, a poem was also written about that rather incredible event that happened on that Boxing Day all those years ago. And that'll just read you one or two extracts from that incredible poem. Said wistful to wanderer, it's a lovely hunting morn. Said Wanderer to Wistful, Hush, I fancy that's the horn. I believe I see his lordship at the fair end on the grey. And it's very strange because I thought they'd taken him away. And as Wanderer spoke to Wistful, a big grey fox broke covert. They threw their tongs and raced away. Heads up, sterns down, they flew. His lordship was calling them. They knew. They knew. They knew. Straight as a line to the churchyard, where said they his lordship waits. There was never a sign of a big grey fox, and the grass was trampled and pressed, where yesterday a 
the best loved man in the Midlands, was finally laid to rest. Now I have also seen two ghosts, and strangely enough one was very near Christmas. It was in fact the last Friday in November, and it was twenty past three in the afternoon. I was in Derby Jail. I'd actually gone in to sort out something rather mundane, the dishwasher. I went into the place and although I've had it now for four or five years, I am of course, like a lot of people, still frightened of it. It has a rather ominous feel to it, even in the daytime, and it is in fact very dark, even in the daytime. I didn't bother to go to the end of the corridor to switch on the lights and went to the kitchen and put those lights on. I went behind to check that the dishwasher had washed through from the night before and yes it had. And the phone went and it was a gentleman from Derby City Council. I was standing leaning on the fridge talking to this chap when down the corridor in front of me, through a cut-out window, I saw what I believe to be a real ghost. It looked like a ghost. It was grey, and when I say grey, I mean distinctly grey. It had no particular shape or form, but I knew it was a person. But I couldn't tell you whether it was male or female. It went down the corridor, past me. I was standing on the phone, and I actually swore. As I said to this chap, I've just seen a ghost. And he said, no, not, I said, really, yes, I have. But excuse me one minute, and put the phone down, and went to the front of the counter. And, and like so many people that actually see ghosts, I tried in my mind to convert it to reality what it should have been. It should have been someone coming in that thought we were perhaps open. And I put my head round the counter and shouted, excuse me, expecting someone to answer. But of course, there was no one there. I was quite alone in there. I went back to the phone, picked it up and said to him, I hope you don't mind, but I may stay on the phone a little bit longer than we'd originally anticipated. And he said, well, why, Richard? What, what's the problem? I said, well, listen to me. When I put this phone down, I'm alone with what's just come in here. And I don't know whether I can cope with that. So, like a fool, we chatted for quite a while. And eventually, of course, I had to say, OK, right, well, um, thank you very much. Thanks for the support. And I put the phone down. And then, of course, I thought, oh, dear. Now I have to go out of here, round to that corridor, where only minutes before I've seen a ghost. Well, the phone went again, and it was my young son, William, who at the time was about 14. And I said to him, William, <laughs> I've just seen a ghost. And I heard this voice shout, Mum, Dad's just seen a ghost. And remember, of course, as I've already told you, I'm frightened of ghosts, and of course my family know that I'm frightened of ghosts. And my wife came onto the phone and was quite kind to me and said, are you all right? And I said, uh, yes, but I genuinely have seen a ghost. And, and I've now got to go out of the building and I, need, I do need to go. And she said to me, well, before you go, I need you to gather some glasses together, drinking glasses together, uh, for a do that we were doing that night in the Heritage Centre. And my comments to her were, do you really think I'm staying in here, gathering glasses? And she said, don't be stupid, you've got to do it. You're there, I'm not coming down to do it. But if you want, I'll stay on the line. So I put the phone down left her on the end of the line while I gathered the glasses 
and every now and then I was shouting to her, I'm all right. Doesn't seem to be anything here now. I'm okay. And then I grabbed the box, put the phone down, and left the building. I think it must have taken me at least five days before I actually plucked up the courage to go back into Derby Jail alone. That was, funnily enough, about four years ago, as it's now the end of November again. And um, I haven't actually seen it again. I do expect to see it, because I really did see it. But the strange thing was that not only did I actually see that figure, but I also sensed it. And it really was a, a soul, a spirit, an entity of some sort that, that did actually have energy, had a presence, had an aura, whatever. And that's the thing that really got to me, was the fact that it's exactly the same as, you know, if you're standing alone, say, in the kitchen, washing up, someone walks in, even though you've not heard them, even if they've got slippers on and they're on a carpet, you know they're there. You turn, you look, you know there's someone there. They have a presence. It's exactly what this spirit had. Not only did I see it, but I sensed it. And of course the other thing is that it has completely altered my attitude to when people tell me stories, when they say they've seen something. I know they're telling the truth, because I also have seen something, something that I can't explain, something that I know beyond all doubt was a ghost. It was Christmas, 1745. Five and a half thousand Highland soldiers under the command of Prince Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, had made their way all the way from Scotland, through England, penetrated five counties in succession, and insulted the very heart of England, and arrived in Derby. They went off to their billets, all five and a half thousand of them, doubling the size of the town, and Bonnie Prince Charlie went off to his quarters in Exeter House, where the police station stands now. All were in very good spirits. They'd got themselves all the way from Edinburgh to Derby without seeing the face of one enemy. They were only 126 miles from London, from the capital, from victory. Bonnie Prince Charlie was the grandson of no less than King James II of Great Britain. And he was on his way back to London to take the throne back and the crown back for the Stuarts. He was so close. Unfortunately, he'd got himself all the way on a wing and a prayer, a pack of lies and that old Stuart charm that men and women were destined to die for. He got himself all the way to Derby without any English support. 300 soldiers had joined him at Manchester and three men joined in Derby. It wasn't enough for his clan chiefs and his generals and they decided that it was probably time for a retreat to go all the way back to Scotland. Charlie wouldn't have it. He was all for the bold dash and he wanted to carry on to London. But his generals decided that they would have a council of war in the panelled drawing room of Exeter House. Before that meeting, Charlie made a bold dash around the county of Derbyshire in the snow and the frost. He went to Nether Hall near Burton. He went 
to Foremark Hall, and he went to Cork Abbey, in the vain hope that he would get some prominent Jacobite lord to write a letter of support. But unfortunately, although they were for him, they wouldn't put their name to a piece of paper, in case later, if he didn't succeed, they would lose their heads. And he came back to that meeting with nothing, with no support. His generals decided that it was time to turn back. Charles was furious. He drew his sword. He said, I would rather be 20 feet under the ground than retreat. You ruin, abandon and betray me if you do not march on to London. But they wouldn't have it. And the decision was made to retreat all the way back to Scotland. Had they have gone on to London, there is every possibility that they would have taken the throne back for the Stuarts. When the government heard they were at Derby, there was a run on the Bank of England, and people were streaming out of the capital, refugees. King George II had his bags packed, and his yacht moored on Tower Quay, ready to take him back to Hanover. Had the Highlanders marched over Swarkston Bridge, on the 6th of December, 1745. When they'd arrived at Derby, they sent a detachment of about 70 soldiers, possibly cavalry, to take Swarkston Bridge. It was the only bridge across the River Trent between Burton and Nottingham. It was the route to London and victory. Those soldiers held on to the bridge for two days. But of course, like the retreating army, were recalled back from that bridge. That bridge is still haunted to this day. The troops of Bonnie Prince Charlie trudged all the way back and only lost 40 men killed all the way back to Scotland. And of course the whole thing ended in bloody defeat at the Battle of Culloden on the 16th of April 1746 when hundreds and hundreds of those soldiers, those brave Highland soldiers who marched to Derby, were killed on the battlefield. And there are many ghost stories to do with Bonnie Prince Charlie and his Highland army in Derby and in Derbyshire. A famous story on Swarkston Bridge. People walking their dogs along the bridge often hear the sound of voices, the sound of battle. But strangely enough, a battle didn't take place in Bonnie Prince Charlie's time, but did a hundred years earlier in the English Civil War. When a skirmish took place on that bridge, people were killed, people were thrown off the bridge and drowned in the water. But people often hear the sound of horses, horses trotting horses galloping across the bridge. No one's sure, but could those phantom horses, the soldiers of Bonnie Prince Charlie, that were recalled from that bridge on that fateful day in 1745. Back to Derby, and there are also ghostly stories again. On the night of the 5th of December, Bonnie Prince Charlie and his officers had prayers in the great church at Derby, which is now Derby Cathedral. Strangely enough, it was a Catholic service in a Protestant church. And on many occasions, people see the figure of what is believed to be an officer, a high-ranking Highland officer, walking out of the doors of Derby Cathedral always around 12 midnight, of course. No one's sure, but could that be the ghost of Bonnie Prince Charlie walking out of Derby Cathedral? And also, Exeter House, where he stayed, where that fateful decision was made. Unfortunately, the house was demolished in 1854, but the panelling was saved and is now the Bonnie Prince Charlie room 
in Derby Museum. Anyone entering that room, day or night, always senses a very, very strong feeling of despair, of foreboding. I believe that the emotions of that young 26-year-old prince, Charles Edward Stewart, of terrible despair is emblazoned in the woodwork of that room. Had he have gone on from there if that decision had been different, it would have brought about a second Stuart restoration. But unfortunately it wasn't to be. The hopes of our the hopes and aspirations of Charles Edward Stuart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, are still held to this day in the very woodwork of that room. There are many people that say that the Bonnie Prince Charlie story isn't romantic, how wrong they are. There are some letters captured in Derby Post Office when the Highland soldiers retreated on the 6th of December 1745. One of them, for some reason, is emblazoned in my mind. And it says the following, Derby, December the 5th, 1745. My dearest Jeannie, we arrived here last night amidst acclamations of the people and public rejoicing which we have had in several places. We have arrived here without seeing the face of one enemy and I hope very soon to write to you from London where if we get safe the whole of our story and what has happened already will appear to posterity more like a romance than anything of the truth. I still remain in good health as does Mr. Orkinleck and all friends do. Please offer our compliments of the season to all our friends and relations. And believe me ever to be your affectionate husband, Peter Ochterlony. Peter Ochterlony was one of Bonnie Prince Charlie's lifeguards. He was a coffee house keeper from Dundee and he had his throat cut on the battlefield of Culloden, the last battle ever fought on British soil. It was Christmas 1920. The premises of John Hefford and Son, boot and shoemakers in Queen Street, just opposite the cathedral, was absolutely full of Christmas stock. In those days, many people, including the Heffords, lived either above the premises or at the back of the premises, as did Mr. and Mrs. Carl Hefford, the present owners of the building. They went to bed reasonably early. They'd done a very big stock check at about half past one in the morning, Mrs. Hefford woke to hear terrible commotion downstairs in the shop. She woke Carl to tell him there were burglars in the shop. Carl woke up, sat up in bed and listened, and he also could hear sounds as if someone was actually throwing things round in the shop. They could hear shoe boxes being thrown, shoes being thrown, and the rustle of tissue paper as it was put, pulled out of the boxes. Carl put on his dressing gown, as did his wife, and they crept downstairs. They could still hear the terrible commotion. And so Carl told his wife to go out of the back door and try and find a policeman. In those days, in 1920, that was quite easy. And she soon found a constable and brought him back 
to the front of the shop. The policeman stood and listened, and he could also hear this terrible commotion, as if someone was going mad inside the shop. They shouted to Carl, who was still standing outside at the back, and the policeman told him to go in through the back door, put on the lights, and the policeman would break in through the front door. Carl opened the door, switched on the lights, as the policeman battered the door in and came in from the front. Everything was calm and peaceful. There wasn't a shoebox out of place. There wasn't a shoe out of a shoebox. There was no sign whatsoever of an entry. There was no sign whatsoever of a burglar. Everything was just as it had been when they left the shop and went to bed. It's something they could never understand. It's something that they told stories about for many years. But they never did get to the bottom of the story of why their shoes and their boxes were thrown around, but of course weren't in the middle of the night. Many, many years later, the Heffords were long dead. They widened Queen Street and they knocked down the Heffords premises. And as they were digging, they found the remains of the lost church of St Mary's, because this was on the corner of Queen Street and St Mary's Gate. And St Mary's Gate is named after a medieval church which once stood on that side. They also found nine graves with coffins, obviously, in them, under the foundations. They were actually, for some reason, actually buried in the nave of the church. They were exhumed, taken away, and reburied in Nottingham Road Cemetery. There were never any disturbances. There never were after that one night with the Heffords. And as far as we know, there's never been anything since. But we wonder why, just on that one night, just before Christmas, that some poltergeist, some restless spirit that was buried underneath that building, for some strange reason, caused all that commotion that night. There are various sorts of ghosts. Some are nothing more than recordings in buildings, especially in stone buildings, um, caused by tragic, traumatic, premature death. Then there are spirits and souls which are still around for whatever reason, sometimes because they have unfinished business, sometimes because they don't know they're dead. Sometimes they choose to haunt. They love the place and they come back. But one of the ghosts that I've seen more than most is the ghost of Mary, Queen of Scots, which of course has many associations with Derbyshire. But the strange thing is that Mary, Queen of Scots' ghost does not haunt the place where she died. And yet, if anyone should haunt a place, then Mary should haunt Fotheringay Castle. She had the most horrendous death. It actually took the executioner three blows of his axe to sever Mary's head. So the terror and torment that that poor woman went through before actually dying, before actually leaving this earth, should be there should be at Fotheringay Castle, but it's not. So why? Why is her ghost seen in so many places? This is only a theory that I have. If a particular person becomes famous, infamous, for whatever reason, it's usually because they have more of a presence, more energy, an aura, charisma, 
energy is what it's all about. And when you meet a person like that, you often say, they left a real impression on me. Do you not think it possible that a person with all that energy and charisma can also leave an impression on the building where they once stayed? She certainly does that in Derbyshire, at Wingfield Manor, at Chatsworth, Buxton Old Hall, Sheffield Manor, Sheffield Castle and Tutbury, although not in Derbyshire, are also places that she was imprisoned for 14 of the 17 years that she was actually imprisoned in this country, in England, by the Earl of Shrewsbury and his wife, Bess of Hardwick, who of course is buried in Derby Cathedral. But Mary's ghost is seen on many occasions at Wingfield Manor. Mary's ghost is frequently seen at... It was Christmas, 1585, and Mary yet again was having to make preparations to move her huge entourage from Wingfield Manor back to her most hated prison, Tutbury Castle. They couldn't, in fact, take her there until January, and it was January the 13th. She was on her way in her coach, and like all people, of course, passing through, she had to make her way through Derby, the crossroads of history. The ways were foul and deep, the snow was heavy, and the coach couldn't make it in one day, and so they had to stop off in Derby. Mary's coach came over St Mary's Bridge, through the town and up St. Peter Street and pulled up the widow Beaumont. Mary said to her, I'm sure we'll get on very well because neither of us have husbands to trouble us. Mary was entertained in that house for the night and then continued on the dreary journey back to Tutbury Castle. It was the Babington plot that sealed the fate of Mary Queen of Scots. Anthony Babington of Derbyshire and Derby was a Catholic and was plotting to murder Queen Elizabeth and put the Catholic Mary on the throne of England. It was his plot that actually Tutbury Castle led to the death or the execution of Mary Queen of Scots. And the irony of the story is that Mary spent her last night of captivity in Derbyshire in the home of the man responsible for her execution, Babington. They say that the ghost of Mary Queen of Scots still haunts the area where Babington Hall used to stand. A figure dressed in Tudor costume in black is often seen walking around the area of both the Nationwide Building Society and the NatWest Bank which now occupy that site. But a ghost has been seen at Wingfield Manor as has the ghost of Babington. The two of them seem to be united in death but of course were never outside United Babington House in life on the corner of Babington a ghost has been seen St Peter Street at Tutbury Castle Mary alighted and many years ago and was greeted by the lady the young boy of 13 house, who was trying to raise money for charity was actually sleeping in the North Tower at Tutbury Castle for the night alone he woke in the middle of the night looked out of one of the slits the arrow slits at the castle and saw in the area where Mary Queen of Scots apartments used to be a figure, a white figure, a see-through figure gliding across the grass towards the tower where he was. It frightened him as you can imagine. He actually retreated up the steps of the tower to the very top. 
but to his horror and shock, the figure came into the tower through the door and started to ascend the staircase to where the boy was. He could hear nothing, but he knew that the figure was coming up the stairs. He was right at the top where the battlements are, and he saw the figure emerge from the staircase and stand at the top of the tower with him. It didn't speak, it didn't look at him, it didn't acknowledge him, it didn't know he was there, but he knew, oh yes, he knew the figure was there, he could see it, he was terrified, and eventually the figure just turned and started to go down the staircase again and left him on his own. That boy, somehow, at the age of 13, managed to continue his vigil all night in that tower and raised a considerable amount of money for charity. Many years later, he became a Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Marines. I actually spoke to his mother in Tutbury when I was doing a ghost walk. And that's where she told me that story. And she said to me, he's 57 now. He's never forgotten that incident in the North Tower of Tutbury Castle. He swears it was the ghost of Mary, Queen of Scots. He says that in all the history books he ever saw at school, all the pictures of Mary resembled that ghostly figure that he saw at the top of the tower. And she said to me, although he's 57 and a colonel in the Royal Marines, I promise you, she said, he's not the sort of man to make up silly ghost stories. Although most people think that they're going to be frightened or terrified of ghosts, the vast majority of people that I speak to weren't frightened when they saw them. You must remember that most ghosts actually look real and look as they did in life. But for some strange reason, we're all terrified, frightened of ghosts. I think it's actually primeval fear. I think we're frightened of the dark. We don't really like to go out in the dark and we most certainly wouldn't walk through the woods or the forests on our own. But what are we really frightened of? Are we frightened of a ghost? Or are we actually frightened of something leaping out from behind the tree? Something like a saber-toothed tiger that is going to eat us. Because I believe that's where our fears really come from. We don't like standing in the dark with an open doorway at the back that we can't see through. That's our fear. But just to end, something to put you in the right frame of mind before you go to bed. This is your worst nightmare. You've been listening to ghost stories and you now have to go to bed. And for some reason, tonight you're alone. You're in the house, all alone. And you have to sleep in that room. You know that room, don't you? The one that you never liked. The one that was always an icy chill in, the one that you avoided, you always kept the door shut. But tonight, you're in it, all alone. You have a couple of very stiff whiskies to help you sleep, and off you go to bed. There's a large, old ash tree by the window. It's winter, there's a full moon, the snow's on the ground, and the wind is just starting to pick up. But strangely enough, you get into bed and you get off to sleep quite easily. It's about three o'clock now, the time when most people die. And the wind has really picked up and it's howling and it's blowing the branches of the tree. And the finger-like branches are starting to rattle and tap on your window, which wakes you up. 
with a start. You open your eyes wide and your worst nightmare is about to unfold. You're not alone. There is something, someone, lurking in the shadows in the corner of your bedroom. <gasps> There's no point in closing your eyes. It knows you're awake. It starts to glide ever so slowly across the bedroom floor to the foot of your bed. It's a horrid figure. It's wearing a cloak and a hood. It has red staring eyes. It has fangs. It has horns. It has black matted hair. And its skeletal like wrists have chains hanging from them as it glides so slowly above the floor across to the foot of your bed. And of course, as it moves, it's moaning. It reaches down to the foot of the bed and pulls out your bedclothes. You know what's going to happen next. So you draw your feet up to avoid those ice-cold skeletal fingers that are starting to slide up the bed to grab hold of your ankles to pull you out of the bed. It grabs hold of your ankles and it starts to pull. And guess what? You wake up. It was a dream. It was a horrid, horrid nightmare. Because I can assure you that ghosts do not do that sort of thing. Most ghosts are here for a reason. They've got unfinished business, a message for you, or they loved you, or they loved the building. Ghosts, as far as I'm concerned, will not hurt you. Most ghost stories, I assure you, can be accounted for. It was your dad walking into the room. It was Fred off the other shift coming in. It was the wind blowing the door, or it was your imagination. One thing I just need to ask you though, what do you think? Is the ghost there, or is it here? Will we ever find out? I do hope that you have someone with you tonight, someone who can escort you up the wooden hill and stay with you tonight through the long hours. Just remember, eight out of ten ghost stories can be accounted for. It's the other two you've got to worry about. Do have a very Merry Christmas. Do sleep well. And don't have nightmares. Sleep tight. <laughs>